Hello, and welcome to tonight's discussion for Daughter of a Lost Bird. My name is Russell Roots, and I am the Community Outreach Manager with the Utah Film Center. Tonight, we have two distinguished guests with us this evening, Stephanie Benelli and Dina Ned. And I'm going to introduce them real quick just before we get started with our conversation. Stephanie Benelli is a member of the Diné Nation. Stephanie is a Native American specialist at Utah Foster Care, which serves Utah chi Utah's children by finding, educating, and nurturing families to meet the needs of children in foster care. Ms. Benelli works daily to educate state child welfare workers, judges, attorneys, and guardian ad litems on the important, importance of placing Native American children in kinship, <clears throat> kinship placements to ensure that they have connection to their families and their culture. As an advocate for Native children in care, she believes when they are placed in Native foster families, they thrive because they will continue to be surrounded by cultural stories, traditions, humor, and food. Stephanie gave testimony for the Native American Women Amicus Brief on the Brackeen versus Holland case, and Stephanie was a stakeholder in Utah's recruitment team for Casey Family Program's National Indian Child Welfare Placement Recruitment and Retention Project. <clears throat> where she led the development of Utah's first statewide Native American foster care recruitment plan. Stephanie has been nationally and locally recognized by Casey Family Systems, National Indian Child Welfare Association, Salt Lake County, and the Navajo Nation 24th Council for her work in child welfare. She is also a former board director with the Utah Urban, excuse me, the Urban Indian Center for Salt Lake and the Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault, UCASA, and a longstanding member of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. Stephanie currently resides in Salt Lake City with her family. Welcome, Stephanie. And now for Dina Ned. Dina Ned is the Associate Professor of the College of Social Work at the University of Utah, is a curricular chair for the BSW program, Bachelor of Social Work, and teaches policy in the BSW and MSW Masters of Social Work programs. In May of 2021, she was named Associate Dean for the U's Office for First Generation Access, which supports the growing diversity of first forward students. Dina upholds her social responsibility as a citizen of both the United States and the Chickasaw Nation. Her experience as a social worker in rural and urban communities motivated her to explore issues of social justice and systemic equity and to promote comprehensive and holistic policy change from and by the perspective of historically resilient peoples. Dr. Ned holds a master's in social welfare from UC Berkeley and a PhD in social work from the University of Utah with additional training as a fellow at the Center for American Indian Health Bloomberg School of Public Health, John Hopkins University and a postdoc certificate in global mental health, trauma and recovery from the Harvard program in refugee trauma. Dina, welcome to tonight's discussion. So um, let's let's really launch into the conversation. This film is a momentous work. It really does do some um, some really unique examination. What does the film mean for the both of you? And I will start with Stephanie. Um, so in watching the film, it um, provides an insight on transracial tran adoption. Um, it's a powerful story about a native person's um, coming home journey. Um, Kendra was 34 years old when she met her first mother and then a year later returned to her tribe to, re to connect. Um, I feel like with this film, it also not only shares her experience and what she went through and what others may experience too, but it also can open a dialogue about transracial adoption, the importance of connectivity to culture and language, and, um, and, and, and also a discussion about the Indian Child Welfare Act so um, I felt that it was a powerful film. Um, I did have the opportunity to attend a workshop that Kendra um, presented last week at the Nickel Conference, and to hear her, you know, provide her um, personal um, account of her homecoming. And not on um, not everyone has that opportunity to be able to go back to the tribe and get that welcome home as she did and her mother did. And um, so in. It, you know, um, it just it makes me reflect also of the people that I've worked with who have in, um, in, in sharing when they share their stories about their um, being adopted um, out of the Native community and then going back and um, just, you know, the struggles and just, you know, their experience too and, and how their um, journey led them to um, reconnect with their family and to their tribe. 
Excellent, wonderful. Dina, your thoughts, please. Um, thank you. Um, Steffi, that's awesome that you got to hear Kendra speak. <laughs> um, because it's sort of it's the it's the epilogue, right? Like what's happened since the uh, documentary was created. Um, so my thoughts on this story, um, and looking at my notes from from watching it, uh, th there were some some statements that Kendra and definitely her mother April um, and her adopted family and the tribal family, right, that they said that really resonated with me. Um, not only in the work that I um, am a part of, but also my own lived experience as a um, in, indigenous, you know, woman um, who grew up that uh, that idea of that statement, like Kendra said about you are native. You can say you're native, right? Because that was that message mm -hmm. from her mm -hmm. her adopted family. But she struggled with, well, what does that mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And I know my my formative years with, with my family, we didn't we didn't live um, where um, my family was from, from Oklahoma. We moved all around the country. So much like Kendra or the messages that her family gave her. And I was not an adoptee. Let me just clarify that. But this idea of what does it mean to be Indian? What does it mean to be indigenous, Native American, tribal, Chickasaw, Choctaw? You know, I, I, even using those words or terminology, you know, um, flows in and out of my conversation and my experience, much like it did in the documentary. But that, that question of, well, if you can pass phenotypically as white, you're okay, no one's gonna ask. Because it, it's like asking about the impact of child removal that Kendra did not know about until this journey of, mm -hmm. um, of the documentary opened her up to of, wow, how do you heal from the impacts of child removal when one, you didn't know it, but in my experience uh, growing up, I knew those histories because it impacted my parents of uh, not speaking tribal languages or sharing in tribal culture or traditions or ceremonies um, because there was this fear that was instilled in my grandparents that you will be removed, you will go to boarding school, uh, you will be forced to speak English, um, and you may not ever come home. Right, so there was that fear involved, but this story of uh, of Kendra's journey and definitely of her mom's that they were able to reconnect and that they were welcomed. That's really powerful, right? Like um, to they they really were addressing those long standing legacy of the impacts of child removal from Native families, and Kendra didn't realize what that meant for her. Mm -hmm. Right, so. Um, maybe I'm rambling, but I, you know, having, you know, hearing the Lummi elders talk about, you know, you have to gain our trust in order to speak, you know, that goes back to that historic um, precedence of uh, removal, right? Mm -hmm. Kill, um, kill, kill the Indian, Indian save Indian, the man. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. All, you know, long history of this you know, forcing of assimilation um, or death in order to belong where you have always existed. So um, getting that sense of belonging between Kendra and April and their community um, was a really beautiful story to, um, to watch. So that was, that's how I was, um, uh, what some of the thoughts I was going through mm -hmm. in watching this and uh, maybe part of our conversation tonight, we'll get into um, the policies that Kendra and her family um, uh, were a part of, mm -hmm. or um, addressing these ideas of trauma, intergenerational, historical trauma. You know, that story of her, of April, how she kept warm as a young woman, <laughs> you know, one arm, the next night, the other, and it's, and the way she tells that, whew, that's traumatic. Mm -hmm. How did she get through that? Right. So, yeah, I could go on and on, but that's my initial response. 
Well, I, I think that's a, a very good place to kind of dive in a little bit deeper because it's like the, we are talking about uh, a historical legacy of trauma that's still prevalent today, unfortunately. Um, it still will have its tendrils in the future as well. Like, and this is rooted around child removal. Can we speak a little bit more about what uh, what that change in what what the current state is and what that change of policy has been, particularly through Utah? Stephanie, would you like to take this? Yeah, the federal assimilation policies that were mentioned in the film, um, the boarding school era, that happened. Um, you know, it ended as late as you know 1978. So that's you know fairly recent and then the uh, the adoption project that happened between 1958 and to 1967 so it's very we're not talking about a time period where it happened 10 or 100 years ago we're talking about you know within the last 50 60 years and um and how this has impacted um you know native families and so um and so it's and and um but yeah, I, you know, there's. I think it's important to to realize that you know that to understand the history and why where where we're at right now and why there is a federal law protecting uh, Native American children, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and so um, I think having that understanding will help um, realize you know that it is important for Native kids to to be in to remain in the Native community in Native homes. Mm -hmm. can, can you speak a little bit more about the the NICWA Act, the uh, Native American Child Welfare Act? So in 1973, or sorry, 1978, it was passed. Um, and the, before the act, 25 to 35 percent of Native Americans were removed from the home, um, and they were, and 85 percent of the of the children were placed in non-Native homes. Um, they were parents were coerced to volunteer um, or you know to agree to give up parental rights, and a lot of so that a lot of removal happened for the assimilation. So they would um, you know be disconnected with their culture and their language. Um, then in the past, it um, it's to um, it was designed to remedy the cultural mistakes that result in the Native American children being removed um, in care, and so. Um, from that, it was requiring a higher burden for um, proof for the removal and re requirements the caseworkers to look beyond the surface and involving the extended families and tribes in the cases. There's also a placement preference program, uh, placement preference. So when a child comes into care and they are, um, and there's reasonable to believe that the child is a native child, the case will be treated as an equal case until um, it's determined that the child is not. Um, when the child does come to care, the placement preference is to place with family first, um, with every child that comes into foster care. And then the second would be to place with a, a native foster parent of the same tribe of that child. And then third would be to place with a, um, a native parent from a different tribe. And then the fourth placement would be to whatever um, home is available. And so with that federal law, you have that placement, pro placement preference. You also have this, um, tribe involved too, because when the child comes into care, the state notifies the tribe that there is a child in foster care that is identified as Native American. And so you have the state caseworker and the tribe working on this case. Um, the state, the tribe does give placement preference on foster care and adoptive placement too. And so it's a federal law that is to protect, um, you know, families and children to, um, from what has happened um, in the past. Okay, and, and thank you for sharing because I think that's very important and a kind of a crucial turning point in the in the film and the conversation about what cultural legacy this has had. Uh, Dina, do you do you have thoughts you'd like to share on it? Um, yeah, um, to to add on to what Stephanie was saying, I, I recall back now to to the film at the end of uh, of why the Indian Child Welfare Act was not used with April and Kendra because at the time they were not enrolled with their tribe. So uh, looking at ICWA, one of the common questions that is asked in, um, in the classroom of future social workers is, why do we have to ask every family if they are native, if they are a member of a tribe, um, if they have tribal ancestry? And I say, because you don't know unless you ask. 
so that had the Indian Child Welfare Act been applicable to April, then she would have had access to her, her, uh, her <clears throat> excuse me, her, her birth certificate. The tribe would have known of her existence um, which is why it was a beautiful story that her father kept looking for her, right? Um, she was never forgotten. And, you know, not every adoptee, not every Indigenous adoptee has this experience, right? That there, there are um, modern day adoptees, you know, because they talked about in the film, like who was the, the lost bird, right? Um, but these stories vary from the most abusive to the most beautiful stories, right? And the Indian Child Welfare Act is this gold standard of how to keep a child connected to who they are, where they come from, and who their family is. And the removal of Native children historically you know, and I'm not going to go back to like boarding schools and the assimilation practices of what would be what went behind boarding schools in the United States, the residential schools uh, in Canada. Um, but to this idea of the other or the majority, like we can do better, like you don't have a good life because you're living with your auntie or you're with your grandparent, like, no, 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 that's not socially acceptable. A child should be raised by their parent, right? It was those types of cultural assimilation that was being forced on native families, right? From 200, 300, 500 years ago to this current story in, in the documentary that um, the Indian Child Welfare Act as a, that gold standard knows that, you know, to coin that the, 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 the popular phrase of the 90s, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Mm -hmm. Indigenous and Aboriginal peoples across the globe know this. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's a gold standard that if you can't take care of your child, mm -hmm. someone else will be, and you will still be connected to them. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, that's, that's the importance of the Indian Child Welfare Act. But uh, big picture, oh, our entire child welfare system would benefit from this type of understanding of who is, who gets called upon to take care of a child who has been neglected or is at risk for abuse while services and community can support that parent to get them back into balance of health, um, um, physical, emotional, mental, psychological, right? Spiritual in order to continue raising their child, right? Um, you know. That's what I wanted to add on to um, about the Indian Child Welfare Act, because you know that Indian Adoption Project that Stephanie talked about, um, and it was 1958, right, to 1967, somewhere in there. So at the end of when the boarding school period was going out of fashion, because really with any type of policy by uh, uh, in our society mm -hmm. that purposely marginalizes or controls um, minoritized populations. Mm -hmm. um, boarding schools went out of fashion. And then, but that idea of we need to save um, the native child, the native family from themselves, we need to help fold them into what it means to be in the United States that's where that adoption project came in, right? Um, mm -hmm. to, and it was created by, I think, the Child Welfare League of America. I mean, there's some sordid history um, that is not as, you know, um, helpful <laughs> as you would have them think, you, that you would think of uh, with a name like, you know, the Child Welfare League of America. Um, but these but these ideas, like Stephanie was saying, you know, 50, 60, one generation, two generations, three generations, 
I still have elders who were part of boarding schools. I have people I know in our communities that were part of the Indian Adoption Project or here in Utah who um, uh, were brought in um, uh, to the Salt Lake Valley, if you will, if not all along the I-15 corridor from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, to live in um, homes and work alongside um, members of the LDS Church. Um, there's just this long history of that there is better, that there is other. Mm -hmm. And even Kendra in the documentary talked about like, hey, I was super, super white and I had a great upbringing and I would never do anything to give up the mother and the father and the family I had, but there was something missing. Mm -hmm. And she was finally able to reconnect with that. It, it's this fascinating um, kind of paradox where it's this, this uh, obliteration by integration and to, to really bring them in destroys what they were previously and they lose track and that it, the, the diasporic aspect of it all. But then you see as Kendra did in the film where she has that moment of, of real introspection where she's grappling with who am I? I identified as white, but now I have this indigenous identity and how do I reconcile this? Is there even reconciliation to be had? It, yeah, exactly. Like at, at that homecoming in the summer of, was it June of 2016? Mm -hmm. She, she uh, Kendra had that moment of, they're all welcoming me as if I'm going to be coming here. Mm -hmm. But that's that lens of which she was raised in mm -hmm. a non-native community, right? Um, that she couldn't understand that it doesn't matter where you are. To be native, to be Indian, to be indigenous stays with us, not the place in which we uh, were removed from, right? Either forcibly mm -hmm. through relocation, right? Uh, through the reservation periods. It's this concept that it was so new and foreign to Kendra, mm -hmm. but you could see her mom had embraced it because her father mm -hmm. found her. Yeah, it's a really wonderful journey. And it's just, it really speaks to who gets the legitimacy to center their own culture. And really when they're trying to find that, going along that path of self-identity, who gets to say I am, and then how do you legitimately live it? See, I want to add to what Daniel was saying about the um, homecoming ceremony. Kendra had mentioned that um, she was given a blanket during that ceremony, and the elders um, told her, you know, if you ever question where you you're, where you are or who you are, where do you belong, just wrap yourself in this blanket to remind yourself that. You know, you are part of um, the, this. You know, the tribe. You have family, and so, and, and that's what she does when she needs that is just to a reminder. And um, but I wanted to share that's what she was sharing with us um, last week. Wonderful. That, that is such a great story. Like I'm, that that sounds really cool. I hope that was recorded because I too would like to check that out because I think the film is wonderful and I'd like to have that little bit of epilogue, like Dina said. Um, I, I want to switch gears for a little bit and actually kind of get more into the personal and kind of really talk about how the both of you kind of found your way into this work, uh, particularly with the areas of expertise you've had. Stephanie, how did you find yourself here? So I've always been um, an act activist for um, the Native communities. Um, it wasn't until this position came open where it was full time where I applied and um, it was a perfect fit. I've always wanted to work. Um, um, full time with the Native American community and not, you know, um, part time or um, so when this position came about, I applied and um, do have some work experience and personal experience with the Indian Child Welfare Act and working with the tribes. And so it was a good fit. Um, and, I've been, you know, I've, like I mentioned, I'm an advocate for the Native community and um, continue to advocate for our kids. It's very important. Um, I not only do I, in interacting with the community as they come and share their stories, um, but it's also just a remind, you know, it's, um, so I'm, I'm glad, to, you know, to be able to have that opportunity to go into the communities and people share, um, you know, you know, at our information tables that we have, um, you know, a, a woman shares her story about um, her reunification with her kids. And then um, 
just recently a woman shared her experience with being adopted in a non-native family and how she um, struggles to connect with her um, culture and her language. And um, so it's it's been a rewarding experience and I don't see this as work. It's, I'm, uh, you know, it's really important that our kids stay in the community and that our elected leaders, our community members know that um, it is important. It, it's, um, it's the social interactions, you know, that our kids need with other natives. It's, um, you know, it's not just checking a list of saying I've taken this child to a, a powwow or read them a book. When I, you know, take my kids to um, to school, I tell them if there's, you know, one day it was raining and there was a rainbow owl, and I was telling them, you know, we don't point with our index finger, we point with our thumbs to the rainbow. And so it's these cultural lessons that happen in the car, at home, around the dinner table. Um, a few weeks ago, my mother shared her story of how she grew up, um, you know, to our, with, shared her experience with our kids. And so it's just, um, you know, I've really enjoyed, you know, working with the community and, and I've always um, enjoyed the work with working with the native population. And that, and that makes total sense. Uh, you know, like you said earlier, before, before we really came online, uh, you know, it's really, this, this work is really about connecting the child to their culture as everyday living, you know, as, as you just pointed out, uh, you know, point with your thumb, or as we saw in the film that uh, Kendra's mother, April, was speaking about, um, you know, her father was pointing at the local man in the group with his mouth. And it's just like, these are these, the cultural signifiers that make up this work that is so exciting. Uh, Dina, your thoughts. How did you get into this? How did you find yourself here? Um, <laughs> how long do we have? Um, <laughs> the, the, the abbreviated version is, it had to do with a lot of self-reflection and understanding my identities or the intersectionality of my identities and how I was viewed within my family and understanding my family history to what um, what I was thought of or considered or understood or misunderstood outside of my family, where, you know, I have a very vivid memory of being in first grade, and it's November, which is American Indian History Month, even way back when I was in elementary school, and the art projects we were doing to represent American Indians. And here's this little six-year-old going, I'm Indian, right? And being told by the teacher and my peers, no, you're not. We don't have Indians in Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, and, or being teased like, well, where's your teepee? Where's your canoe? Where's, you know, uh, where's your um, totem pole? And I'm like, uh, that's not me. Like, I didn't even understand what that was but I knew I was Indian, I, that's shared by my family. It, but then I went almost 12, 15, 18 years before I ever told anyone or revealed who I was or where I was from or my history. So when I finally did that, I was in university and I was seeing uh, and meeting other students of, um, other students of color, other native students, um, uh, di different tribal um, histories and um, and ceremonies. And I'm like, wow, okay, I found my way home. And from that mentorship in the community by, um, by elders who were like, well, what are you going to do? Now that you know mm -hmm. and you see this for what it is and you see the stories or the histories that are shared, but you know the true history of the stories um, what are you going to do about that? And I'm like, um, I don't know. <laughs> and they guided me into social work and specifically into child welfare. So um, my education, whew, literally and figuratively into the child welfare system um, and then proudly saying, I will, you know, I want the, 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 native, the native cases you know, I want to enforce, I want to understand, I want to interpret the Indian Child Welfare Act for our county, our state, where I was you know, working for DCFS, the Children and Family Services. Um, and then it just built from there, because when you see need, 
um, or where I could see an experienced policies that again, purposely structured to control, to assimilate, to limit mm -hmm. in order to create, you know, um, a society based on shared values or, or ideologies. I'm like, mm -hmm. mm, but we're all different. <laughs> so that's what led me to um, more opportunities and uh, to, to understand, to interpret, to train, to educate um, between academia mm -hmm. and the training of um, an education of the next generation of professionals, of social workers, of teachers, educators, lawyers, right? Uh, doctors, health professionals, right? Um, of history, like here's what happened, here's how it looks today, and how can you be an agent of change? Mm -hmm. um, so that there is understanding of why we have the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, why the status, the sovereign status of federally recognized tribes is so critical to the survival because we've gone through this period of, you know, systematically dismantling a people, you know, indigenous peoples. And the last straw was removal, removal of the children. I, why? <laughs> I mean, it's insidious, you know? It, and that's, right? That's US genocide of indigenous peoples, um, North America, um, you know? So that's, that's what propels me. Because until we have all histories, mm -hmm. right, shared mm -hmm. and understood so that we can understand better ways of, of communication and equity um, and really appreciating and understanding what is diversity and what is the United States, where are they going now in the 21st century, right? What worked and what didn't work in terms of... <laughs> Um, annihilation or assimilation of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. How, why did we persist? There's a reason why. Because we gotta get that story out. You know, and that's a really great, um, a really great thing you're saying there. Because I was going to touch on that too. Because I listened to the both of you tell your your stories of how you you're doing the work, and you saw that there's this gap that culturally was needed for you to step into and tell, you know, live with your lead, with your lived experiences, and make sure that they are understood and respected and legitimized, particularly in a, a regard where there's a community such as yours that has had so much mislabeling due to media, and what movies have done, what books have done, and it's just, this is, um, it, it is an uphill battle, and you two are on the front line. And your work is greatly appreciated. <laughs> so I think the thing that's 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 super interesting, and I as we move into our last question here, is really to talk about where do we go from here? What do you see as the future? Stephanie, would you like to lead us off? Sure. So what I see the future is that um, Utah will have a, their own state, if a lot. Right now, there are um, ten states across um, the United States that have their own ICWA law, and so. Um, it's been, it's been something that's been talked about. We, we formed a committee on um, getting this started. Um, but eventually, we were, I'm hoping that it will happen um, soon rather than five, 10 years down the road. And then also, I would like to see an ICWA court too. Um, there are some ICWA courts already. Um, I believe the one that just um, that was established was in New Mexico. And so, they're again at all, um, and that's a, a, a court designed just to hear ICWA cases. So it's a docket just solely on, um, you know, attorneys and uh, judges to just hear just only ICWA cases. And so that's what I would like to see is just, you know, those two, um, the ICWA law, the state law and the um, ICWA court. And then just a continuing training for our um, caseworkers and, um, you know, you know are on the child that are working on equal cases. Mm -hmm. um, 
a few years ago, we had an opportunity to do an immersion um, program with the Navajo Nation um, caseworkers, the Guardian Litem. Um, at the time, Lisa Lee with CCFS and I were able to go and shadow um, IFWA caseworkers with Navajo Nation. And it was a great opportunity. And I would hopefully be able to see that happening again because it gives the opportunity for the caseworkers that are working on Navajo court cases to see how tribal caseworkers are, how they have to travel, um, you know, hours just to do a home visit. And so when we were able to do that, we, we saw, you know, it's a rule, um, the reservations rule, the roads are not, you know, always paved um, to the house. And then to go and meet with the families and just to have that experience and have, um, you know, to meet the families, the kinship families, to sh have them share, you know, their, open their home and share their story. So I think, you know, those type of trainings is needed for our caseworkers to see that not every child needs to grow up in a white picket home with, you know, um, grass and, and indoor plumbing. This family that we were able to meet on the reservation um, is a grandfather who adopted his grandson. They live in a traditional home on no indoor plumbing, dirt floor. Um, and the child's thriving. He's learning Navajo and English. His grandfather is a medicine man and teaching um, the child, um, you know, the, the you know, ceremony. And so it's, you know, again, showing, having that training for caseworkers to, to see that this is um, the traditional, some people, you know, choose to live this way. It's not that they can't afford to, you know, move to the city, but it's just their life, their, you know, their choice of lifestyle. And children thrive. It's, child that we met was had this huge smile on his face and he was happy and healthy and so I think it's um again just you know continuously providing these trainings for our caseworker our guardian items wonderful thank you I'm so looking forward to that vision Dina your thoughts um uh, well a positive thing that's happening here in Utah was the passage of I think it was SB 28 that is creating now in the state of Utah, an Office of American Indian Alaska Native Health and Family Services. And that will be under the Utah Department of Health and Human Services. Um, just taking a look at my notes. Um, this type of action that is supported by the Utah legislature and has been years in the making um, is going to make certain that indigenous children and families get protected when they enter into the state child welfare system. And speaking of the child welfare system, if we look at this, um, again, now what's the future like, 21st century? These systems that were created in the, um, in the mid and late 20th century do not work for our populations, not just for indigenous families, but for all families, individuals, children, who get caught up in a system or institution in the United States. So in child welfare, um, we need to deconstruct this deficit model of how children are removed from their families or their communities when these are issues that, um, these are structural issues, I guess I should say, or barriers that we need to change those structural barriers and inequities that set families up to struggle before they've even entered into the child welfare system. Um, too many times I'd go to court um, as a child welfare worker and the judge would say, okay, parent, uh, in order for you to be reunified with your child, I want you to have, you know, appropriate clothing for the weather, appropriate heating or cooling in your home. Oh, and by the way, you need to have housing and you need to have a job and you need to be able to, you know, keep paying your electrical bill, right? Because you're going to have to keep that refrigerator on. It's like, your honor, these are structural barriers of poverty, you can say what you want these the families to do, but if they had that before, you wouldn't see them in front of you mm -hmm. and the system would not have gotten involved in removing a child for neglect or abuse, right? So um, that's where I see the future going and something like SB 28 
uh, to, uh, to have an office, to have staff, to have funding in order to look at these issues, to get good information, good data, build strong relationships with the tribes and the tribal communities here in the state of Utah in order to make these change happen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both for the conversation this evening. It has been um, a wonderful and informative, illustrative journey. Um, I'm so grateful that we were able to have it tonight. Uh, so we're moving to the end of the conversation now. And uh, I do want to thank our guests again, Stephanie Benali and Dina Ned for joining us tonight. I'm Russell Roots, Community Outreach Manager with Utah Film Center, and I do welcome, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I want to invite you to our next week, our film next week, which is uh, Follow the Drinking Gourd, which is uh, part of our Black Bold and Brilliant series taking place at 7 p.m. Other than that, have a nice evening, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night.